Here's what we've done so far in class. We've talked about the broad classes of forests that are um, broad classes of forests as we look across the globe. And we've talked about evolutionary mechanisms that lead to the, those um, patterns of forest structure that we see when we, when we think about the entirety of the globe. This is the right time to talk, ab to talk about what is the most pervasive and possibly one of the most impactful changes to forest ecosystems that we collectively face. And I, I mean the, in the entirety of, of, um, of forest ecosystems as we know them. That is climate change. The environment is one of the most influential factors that shapes the way forest communities look, the specific adaptations that forests have to temperature, to moisture, to um, other kinds of events, biophysical events like fire or biotic um, challenges like insects and pathogens. Adaptation is a reflection of the history of these organisms and the challenges that they have faced. So it's the right time to talk about climate change. What could be more constant over the history of living things on Earth than the influence of climate on the way they look and the way they work? Okay, so let's just talk about this. Um, and I always like to I always like to start any discussion about climate change with a provocative statement. You ready for this? Don't believe in climate change. And what I mean by that is in the specific definition of what a belief is, an acceptance that a statement is true or that something exists. And the problem word here is acceptance. The other part of this is trust, faith, or confidence in something, someone, or something. What I want to challenge you to do is to use your capacity for inference, for reaching a conclusion based on evidence, based on reasoning. Now, you may come to understand that climate change is ongoing, that climate change is influencing natural ecosystems and forests. Furthermore, you may come to understand that anthropogenic drivers are responsible for much of that change in the climate. That is, uh, I, I want to distinguish here an inference that you are making based on data data which you can access, data which you can validate is accurate. It is, um, it is an evidence-based uh, point of understanding. And I would contrast that with belief, which can be something that is intangible, something that um, is a conviction, or something that is true to who you are, but is intangible. So you know, believe in yourself, believe in your family, believe in your community, believe in humanity. Use inference to understand climate change. And um, I think that that will make you uh, in a stronger position to, to uh, do something about it when it affects something that you care about your family or a forest or so forth. Cool. So I uh, always like to go through a bit of basic information about the climate of the earth. Um, again, uh, there's so much scientific consensus on climate change and the role of people, specifically the role of industrialization in influencing climate change. It's easy to, to miss a lot of the basics. Um, and the risk there is that there are many, um, we understand a lot about the history of climate on Earth and its dynamics, 
and it can easily be twisted into misinformation when you're not familiar uh, with it. So um, one of the things that I like to point out about the history of climate on Earth is that it is by no means static. It is a, the climate variation on Earth has been wildly, um, wildly variable. Uh, during the first of, uh, formation of the planet, it was essentially kind of a, a molten, um, you know, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it. You know, it was like a molten ball of, of uh, wasn't plasma, but, you know, melted minerals and, and stuff. Um, at some point, the earth cooled below boiling, and that allowed for uh, the formation of, um, for the consolidation of water and the formation uh, of, a, um, of a thicker atmosphere. Now, several billion years ago, uh, we have the first life appear, and what's remarkable about that is that it wasn't actually, relatively speaking, it wasn't actually that long after the, the Earth cooled to, the, to below boiling. Um, you know, half a billion years, uh, maybe? It's not actually very long. You know, the Earth was a kind of a, I don't know if it's right to call it room temperature, but you know, below boiling uh, mix of chemical constituents only for like 500 million years or something. It's not really that long. Um, and uh, life emerged. Uh, we have the first, uh, the first living things, known living things. Um, you know, about three, you know, under four billion years ago, before present, as we understand. And um, there was a long period of microbial, microbial, where microbes dominated the earth. Now, one thing I want to point out to you here is this kind of funny event that happens um, right here, this thing called Snowball Earth One. Uh, a remarkable thing happened about, that's about two and a half billion years ago, the all, almost the entire surface of the Earth froze into a, uh, almost a single mass of ice. Uh, a, a degree of freezing which is just bizarre, crazy to think about, um, that is thought to have um, possibly been, uh, probably, associated with dramatic changes in atmospheric chemistry, especially uh, a big input of oxygen into the atmosphere, maybe some other factors that we don't understand. <coughs> this, this freezing of the earth was, um, was thought to have been so complete that it almost led to the extinction of life. So it's, it's, it's thought, it's not clear, um, but it's thought that in the very deep oceans, there was probably still liquid water and that was a reservoir of life. So when they, um, eventually when the earth thawed out, there was still, there were still living microbes that could be populated. But it was a, it certainly was a massive extinction event. Uh, that's one of the kind of intriguing things and why um, planetary scientists are so interested in places like Europa, you know, this cold moon of, um, is it Jupiter or Saturn? I can't remember. You know, one of the outer planets. It's a, it's a moon. It's a pretty big moon, but it's you know it's got a crust of I of frozen material. It's like frozen methane or something, um, but it's got a liquid ocean. It's there's um you can you, there's evidence of a liquid ocean underneath it, and, and it's and it's thought that perhaps there could be some form of life there, which would be really wild. Um, the, uh, there's a long period of where microbes are um, dominating the Earth. Oh, Jupiter. Thanks. Yeah, Europa's Jupiter. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. Jupiter has got, Jupiter's closer. So, is that, did you learn that in 2001 Space Odyssey? Who's watched 2001 Space Odyssey recently? Yeah, that, what, is it Europa? You know? I can't remember where they go. They're looking for the origins of life, maybe. I don't know. Or they're going, they're just 
dealing with a homicidal computer. I, I'm, if you haven't seen it, you should watch it. It's a beautiful film. It's, it's perplexing. But. I think you're right, though. I think they do go to Europe. I think it's, yeah. yeah. Anyway, no. Okay. Um, the, uh, let's see. After Snowball Earth 1, we have this long period of um, where, uh, you know, it's, it's microbes. The first eukaryotes appear. And then um, you have this uh, supercontinent that forms, and um, at some point you have a second you have a second uh, snowball Earth like event. It's called the Snowball Two or Slush Ball. There's um, it's thought to have not fr frozen as completely, but it was still a period where the Earth most of the Earth's surface froze, and the oceans probably mostly froze and were really slushy and so. Forth. It, not as not as extreme as Snowball Earth One, but still really dramatic changes in the surface of the Earth. Cool. So um, you know there are a lot of other late things that happen, and and we'll talk and we'll just go and talk about those here going forward. Cool. So um, the the physical environment. You know, one of the points here is that the the, the climate is by no means static on the planet and the physical environment is not static either there have been periods where the continental land mass has um has been uh more combined together or all in one one formation and uh i've got a friend who's a um he's a geologist and he was he was saying how bizarre earth would look if you were an alien um alien uh, visitor uh, doing a survey of the planets on this eco uh, in this solar system you would have this one planet that's mostly water and it has a few areas where the continental crust is thicker and it's it's thicker there because the the material is less dense so it's actually ra raising up above the surface of the water anyway that's just a that's just a that, that's just a, a tidbit but um, one of the things that was important here is that the the, the land mass was, was was together and then it broke up and um, that has had a big effect on on climate variability. So a um, couple other things, you know, a couple other details that I want to point out. You know, again, kind of just touching on this variable climate, this dynamic climate. Um, we have had variable changes in ice coverage over the last 500 million years, including periods uh, where ice co the covering of the, of the surface of the earth by ice was much greater than current. Um, the Wisconsin ice maximum is the distribution, this map is showing you the distribution of land ice uh, around the last glacial maximum. So it was during the height of the last ice age, if you will. Um, and what's, what I want to point out here is just look at how extensive ice covering was in the Northern Hemisphere. There's a lot of land in the Northern Hemisphere. That's one of the reasons why boreal forests are so widespread. Uh, but it also meant that there was a lot of opportunity for the surface of the Earth and a large proportion, relatively large proportion of the surface of the Earth to be covered in ice during this period. This, uh, particularly the, the um, ice that, uh, the ice sheet that covered Canada, the Laurentian ice sheet, was um, thought to have been almost a mile thick in some places. That is a massive massive layer of ice, so massive, so heavy, that it compressed the surface of the Earth, and the rebound of that surface can be measured today. So I, I did a master's degree at the University of Maine, and um, I was blown away when I learned that. I took a geology, uh, um, a glacial geology class, because it's a very important history of the landscape there. And that rebound is actually measurable there because it was just so much ice. Now, um, this is, of course, to acknowledge that the climate was very different at that in that period. Um, but I also just want to point out that ice, kind of the other thing that's kind of obvious with this, or 
yeah, the thing that's inescapable with this. And that's that that ice just scoured off the surface of the earth, scoured everything, ripped off all of the vegetation, all of the soil, and just um, took, gathered up everything and ground it up into dust. Now, eventually this ice melted and all of that material that was in the ice sheet just fell out of it. So um, when you are in the northern part of the country or if you go up into Canada, that landscape reflects this history. Lots of the soils and landforms are a uh, reflection of having this massive ice sheet on top of it. And it influences the distribution. Of, those things influence the distribution of trees. So um, like I say, what we've got here, or, uh, we've got, you know, this period is we're talking about the land plants, lots of uh, more complex animals are um, appearing. The climate is variable when you look at it over the course of millions of years. Um, but one thing that's interesting, and we're able to track this with indirect methods, is we can see this important pattern that global temperatures track the amount of carbon dioxide that is present in the atmosphere. Now, look at this data. This is a temperature change, very specifically a temperature change, and a concentration of atmospheric carbon dioxide. How in the world, how in the world could you measure carbon dioxide in the atmosphere millions of years ago? Yes, please, Anna. Can't you do it through ice? The atmosphere is trapped in the ice. So yes, this is not an ender, that is exactly one of our best sources of information about this. And when I say infer, it is a direct measurement of historical atmospheric concentrations. Now, there's also a direct way to infer temperature from those same ice cores, and I'll talk about that in just one second. So this is not some like hocus pocus here, it's actually a direct measurement. And the patterns here that I wanna point out are that you have relatively high concentrations of CO2 in this period where ice coverage is relatively minimal, the CO2 concentrations declined to very low levels during this period of uh, relatively high glaciation. They rise and so does global temperature, and then they come down in, um, as we approach modern day. That is the um, last glacial maximum and, uh, period that, and the, the modern period that follows it. Okay, so how do we know that these changes are happening? One of, the, um, one of the more important ways that we can measure this is through the discrimination of stable isotopes, and then particularly this stable isotope called oxygen-18. It's a naturally occurring uh, stable isotope of oxygen. And essentially, it's got two extra neutrons in the um, nucleus, nucleus of the elements. That makes each atom heavier but it is not radioactive, it's not decaying, it's, it's stable. Um, so that means that it just, it just kind of kicks around. Stable isotopes are, are really handy. Um, there's another one called carbon-13, maybe you've heard of. Whenever something is, is heavier, it gets discriminated in various ways. Heavier things take more energy to pick up. Carbon-13, it takes more energy for plants to absorb. Oxygen-18 is heavier. It takes more energy to get it in from a liquid form and into a, a gaseous form. It is naturally discriminated by temperature. So what happens is you, you end up having higher oxygen-18 concentration closer to the equator, and it decreases as you get up into the north. That's just the nor That's just this natural pattern, so to, uh, that happens with the um, O18. But if you change global temperature, that also changes this relative relationship, um, this uh, latitudinal relationship that you can measure on the surface of the Earth. 
with understanding that, you can go to your ice cores and you can analyze them, not just for their CO2 concentrations, but also for the changes in oxygen 18, and you can reconstruct temperature. Here's a little bit more information about this, and these are um, the, uh, these isotopes also get caught in um, marine sediments. So you can actually go back longer than ice cores um, and uh, by, by coring um, deep ocean sed uh, sediments. So this is kind of a, tells you how far back you can go and make direct measurements, or make measurements of CO2 concentration and oxygen 18 from ice cores. The ice cores have been, you can get much further in the past if you core in Antarctica. That ice has been around longer. Um, it's, you know, and, and the Antarctica is on, is on land, and so that ice is more stable than the ice that's on the, on the northern, um, on the North Pole, which is uh, over water. Um, but you can, you can fill in some gaps, you can get deeper back by doing uh, cores of uh, marine sediments, and that's how we can go back uh, 70 million years or so, and then uh, there are some other ways of going back even further. But this is, this is pretty far. Um, and what I want to point out here is just what's, you can, you can track changes in oxygen 18, and you can also do um, track changes in atmospheric uh, CO2 concentration. So, um, you know, I think that these are pretty well developed over the long term. They're good data. They have been extensively vetted, and they have been, um, th these results are repeatable. You can go out to many different sediments or many different places where you can core the ice and you can find consens a consistent message. And that is that global temperatures track CO2 concentrations. So let's ask the obvious question. Again, we're working on inference here. We're all about inference, data driven. So which comes first, temperature or CO2? Is it a chicken or the egg question? Or not? CO2? It's definitely not a chicken or the egg question. CO2 comes first. And here's how you know. This is, this is how you can understand this. And this uh, really kind of wraps everything up here. What we got here is this is a graph showing um, the energy fluxes of the planet, um, the planet Earth, relative to a hypothetical object called a perfect black body. So you see this black curve here? This is a, um, it's, it's a theoretical object, this doesn't exist. Um, but a perfect black body would be something that releases radiation, energy, at the same wavelengths that it absorbs it. So it's, it's just like a mirror, it's like an energy mirror. It just reflects at exactly the same wavelength. Energy comes in, it, it's, it is untransformed and then leaves the same way. This is the profile of electromagnetic radiation that we get from the sun. It peaks at these wavelengths here, and then there's this long tail. Um, if the Earth perfectly radiated um, energy that it absorbed, then um, this is what the, uh, what the release curve would look like. Now, that's a theoretical object that doesn't exist, and the release of energy is actually deviates from it in, uh, substantially, and especially in these pits. You see these pits right here, these kind of blue things? These are places where the release of energy is lower than expected. So where is that energy going? It is being absorbed by the atmosphere. And um, what happens is when this is just like a photon, comes in here and hits a molecule, can do a number of things. Um, it can be reflected off them. Um, photon can be, the energy in the photon can be absorbed by stretching out the uh, electron orbits or bending the electron orbits. All these things represent an increase in the energy state, and that is to say an increase in temperature of that individual molecule. And now I'm going through this like piece by piece. 
but here's why. Funny story. Two years ago, we got this letter in the Environmental Science uh, Management Department, or Natural Resources Management Environmental Sciences Department, that was said, uh, it was from an alumni, and it was somebody who had done like a geology degree or something here, and they were really upset that uh, when they came to understand that we were, we included climate change as part of our instruction. And the, the letter, which was well written, uh, went to at great lengths to argue that climate change could not happen because it would violate the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics states that you can't, um, can't create or destroy energy. And what we understand about climate dynamics on Earth do not require the second law to be violated. We have a constant amount of energy that comes in from the Earth and a constant amount of energy that is being released from the Earth. But some of that energy is being absorbed in particular wavelengths. And that electromagnetic radiation is being transformed uh, and stored temporarily in the atmosphere of the Earth as an increase in heat. So what, what drives that? <clears throat> Well, there's two major things I want to point out. One is water. Water is actually a, an excellent greenhouse gas. It holds a lot, a lot of energy. It has what's called a high latent heat capacity. Um, what that means is it takes a lot of energy to heat up water, and it takes and it holds onto that energy for a long time. So, uh, I just poured tea on myself. That was, would have been funnier if we had been together. Mm. My I always try to drink some tea when I make this joke, but um, I just poured it on myself. Here, I, I have a spare. <clears throat> always come to class prepared. Uh, anyway, um, it takes a lot of energy to heat up water. One of the reasons that you can make tea with it, and it's, you can kind of enjoy it over a long period of time or during class uh, while you're giving a lecture, not burn out your voice, <clears throat> is because it holds onto its heat for a long period of time. Um, it helps make coffee and I don't know, I'll, yeah, <laughs> there's probably more important things than, than, than my tea, but um, water holds onto heat for a long time, it has a high latent heat capacity. That is really helpful um, for sustaining life on Earth because it keeps temperature relatively constant. But it also means that the atmosphere, which has lots of water in it, has a high capacity to absorb heat. Now, um, there are other greenhouse gases uh, or other gases that absorb heat, um, oxygen and ozone, and um, those are relatively constant, however, and the other one that's um, more that is uh, more variable is carbon dioxide, and uh, this has a number of peaks that uh, have the capacity to absorb, to retain, to absorb electromagnetic radiation and retain that energy as heat. And that's why you probably already knew about it before I started talking about it. This same phenomenon happens with other greenhouse gases that you may know about, including methane, nitrous oxide, and other, um, uh, other uh, complex organic chemicals that are sometimes released from industrial processes. In each case there, uh, the, the molecules themselves are able to absorb some uh, wavelength or multiple wavelengths uh, in the electromagnetic um, spectrum and thereby hold heat. So, like I said, energy in equals energy out. The, unit, the, the Earth does not violate the second uh, the second law. Um, but if you change the atmosphere, it will affect the thermodynamics of the planet. 
Um, if you have more greenhouse gases, more water, more CO2, more methane, there is the capacity to retain more electromagnetic radiation as heat. Eventually, it is radiated out. It's radiated back into space. You can measure that with a satellite. It's actually, it's not that hard. Um, well, I mean, it's hard to launch a satellite, but you know, it's, it's not that hard uh, once you have it. Um, what you, you know, what, what you end up with is, uh, and what's been shown, the Earth scientists have been able to, to quantify a lot of the thermodynamics, how much electromagnetic radiation is coming in, how much is absorbed by the atmosphere, this is very uh, important for us, how much is going out, the amount going out is lower than that's coming in, and um, there are other, many other kind of details here that are, that are relevant. Um, there's a lot of energy is released back into the atmosphere by evapotranspiration from plants. That move, evaporating water out of plants through photosynthesis moves a lot of energy. Um, and uh, much of it is, is reflected right off the surface of the earth or even uh, reflected off clouds. There is a um, characteristic of physical objects called uh, albedo. And this is the uh, amount of radiation that a physical object will reflect. Um, anything that has a lighter color reflects more radiation. So snow reflects a lot of electromagnetic radiation. White clouds reflect lots of electromagnetic radiation. So um, snowy surfaces, ice, cloudy areas, absorb, uh, the surfaces absorb less radiation. They have a higher albedo. Cool, okay. So that's how the thermodynamics of the system work. Um, there have been, um, here's a little bit about albedo, and it's, I think that um, it's just not that surprising. The albedo is higher as you get up into the northern latitudes. That's because these are oftentimes covered in snow or ice. There's a very high albedo in North Africa, and that's because it's a, it's a desert. It's kind of a light-colored desert. And then there's a very uh, high albedo in um, Antarctica because it's, because it's ice. And you can see a lot of these patterns, they repeat. The um, deserts that are uh, north of South Africa and Namibia um, and uh, Angola, Botswana, those have high albedo, same in Australia and in Western North America. These kinds of, um, these, these landscapes just reflect a lot of radiation. Uh, forests are kind of intermediate. Um, in some respects, they'll, they reflect a lot of radiation. They will, um, forests, particularly when there's a high snow cover, will reflect a lot of radiation. Uh, but in um, dark forests and so forth, actually absorb some. But that's by design because they're powering photosynthesis. There have been a number of other um, events that influence the uh, thermodynamics of the atmosphere, and particularly volcanic eruptions. And you can look through the history of volcanic eruptions on Earth, including some of them that are quite old. This is uh, uh, was the eruption um, associated with Mammoth Mountain. Mammoth Mountain is uh, um, actually one side of a caldera, a massive kind of collapsed cone. Um, and that, th that eruption, I don't know, it spewed, I don't know, like tens or hundreds or maybe thousands of cubic kilometers of material. I can't remember now, I'm, I'm probably wildly off there. But um, so, so much material that it would have totally changed global climate. Um, we've seen changes in global climate associated with, with volcanic eruptions. This is Pinatubo. It was in the Philippines in um, the late 80s or early 90s. This had a measurable effect on, um, on global climate. It cooled. Um, it, the, the release of all this material increased global uh, albedo, and the temperature went down a measurable amount for a year or a year and a half. It actually did cause some problems with the uh, food supply in parts of the world. Um, 
from parts of the world who are far away from, uh, from Pinatubo. And there's some other things that are kind of interesting. Some of these big eruptions that happened um, in the last 500 years or so, 800 years, they're associated with um, global famine and, and other kind of uh, quirky things. Um, if you look at the art uh, in Europe, it's like from 1400 to 1600, there's lots of portrayals of winter. And this was a period where the climate was much cooler, probably associated with volcanic eruptions and um, the culture reflected that. Now, another, um, just one more basic thing to make sure that we're all on the same page and we're going for inference here. I have to assume that in none, none of your classes, you've gotten to go through all the basics of how the thermodynamics of the Earth works. And as I say, it's very easy for misinformation to um, be perpetuated when uh, you don't when you when you don't know how all the pieces fit together. Now, when you look across the surface of the Earth, you see tremendous variation in overall climate. Deserts are hot and dry. The tropics tend to be hotter and wetter. Um, certain parts of the world, like the Pacific Northwest and the North Island of New Zealand, are very wet. Why is that? What is happening there? Well, differences in the the Earth is a the Earth climate system is complex, and it is a set of interactions um, that uh, that reflect the influence of land mass, of albedo, and the distribution of oceans, and especially the the, the um, movement of ocean waters um, that, that reflect the interactions of all these things to create variation in climate that we see on land that influences forest distributions. So differences in radiation absorption create these complex patterns. And what we end up with is um, heating in, of ocean, ocean waters in the tropics primarily. Um, uh, water is, it's in a constant state of flow. Um, water in the oceans, it moves across the entire surface of the earth on, it's, um, I can't remember how fast it moves. It's, it's faster than I would expect, like around 20 years. It's thought that the entirety of the ocean system kind of like moves from one part of the, part of the world to the other. So it's a lot of water movement. There's a lot of potential energy stored in that water and it has a, 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 an undeniably profound influence on, on um, the climate dynamics of the land masses. So here's an example. Let's look at the UK or Scandinavia. Those are relatively nice places to be. Uh, UK has kind of a dreary long winter, but um, there's very little snow. It's a warm climate. Um, this area, Scandinavia, UK, Northern Europe, for, uh, supports by and large uh, forests that are similar to the Eastern United States. Now, if you go from this part of the world and go directly west to North America, you end up in some of the least hospitable parts of it. Greenland, Labrador, Baffin Island, places that are very cold, that oftentimes do not support forests at all. And the reason for that is because these, um, these lands are adjacent to cold currents. So the climate is much colder there. And you can see um, this pattern uh, repeats itself in many places. We get cold ocean currents that come down from Alaska. We have the California currents. If you're a surfer, you know that it's, the water is absolutely frigid here in, in, um, in, excuse me, in the spring. And that keeps the landmass cold and keeps the, the climate nice here in San Luis Obispo and means that we don't live in the desert. Um, and uh, and um, yeah, the ocean has a very strong influence on 
um, terrestrial climate dynamics um, and uh, terrestrial climate dynamics and the distribution of forests. So, yeah, and this whole conveyor system, this is the ocean conveyor system, is um, it's just uh, fundamental to to how uh, to to the distribution of forests and the distribution of all, all kinds of aspects of, of human civilization as they are um, as they are right now, as it is as it stands right now. Oh my God, it's almost four. <clears throat> okay. Question about the uh, yes ocean currents. What's that? Mm, just a quick question. So every time those currents cross. Um, is it just going to be middle of the road as far as hot or cold currents or? What's actually happening is in lots of places, the currents are going like this. And there may be, um, oftentimes there's a warm current uh, um, underlaid by a cold current. And I think they switch in some places. Well, I guess not. I guess warm water is going to be above uh, cold water. Um, they're actually, they can be passing like this underneath each other. And, and the, the movement of the, the cycling of conveyor, conveyance of water in the oceans is really much more complicated than I understand. And I can really do justice to it. I mean, it's undeniably important because it influences so many aspects of, of natural vegetation distribution on Earth. So if you're interested in it, I'm. You have my full support for for looking at it. I think it's I think it's important. But all of that all of that is to bring us up to to present day. Why should we care about changes in current atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations, and why is it of consequence? Carbon dioxide. Um, Atmospheric concentrations have been steadily increasing since they were first, uh, since we first started monitoring them. Um, I think it's around 1950. Um, these uh, was just kind of a, a general monitoring of, of atmospheric chemistry. Um, they've been steadily increasing in variation in accordance with, um, with global um, industrial output. And there's a Two patterns I want to point out here. One is that overall they're increasing, and two, there's this very easily a very recognizable pattern within years. The um, the average concentration is steadily increasing, but there's this variation. There's this distinct um, uh, peak, maximum, and minimum that happens annually. So what is going on there? Every year, there is a seasonal peak in CO2 concentration, uh, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, um, and a seasonal minimum in CO2 concentration. The maximum happens in winter, and the minimum happens in summer in the Northern Hemisphere. Why? Someone speak. I have to rest my voice to drink this plant tea. respiration. Say again. Uh, plant respiration. Well, that's that's part of it. Uh, tell me more. Uh, how would that how would that make the seasonal peak and maximum minimum? And when, when would it happen if respiration was driving it? Um, well, a lot of plants like shed their leaves and stuff in the winter and can't you know take in carbon dioxide and makes oxygen. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But is that respiration? If you're taking um, it, you get to. What's the name of that again? <laughs> <laughs> photosynthesis. There we go. Yeah. Yes, there we go. So photosynthesis in the Northern Hemisphere, photosynthesis peaks in the summer. And it actually measurably depletes the um, pool of CO2 in the atmosphere wild right it's wild that it's um that there's enough there's there's that much for us there's that much photosynthesis it actually uh, has a measurable depletion of co2 concentration um now in the winter 
Broadleaf forests lose their leaves. Conifers mostly shut down their photosynthesis. They have their leaves, but they're mostly dormant. And that means that photosynthesis uptake of CO2 diminishes and CO2 amounts increase. If you were to go to the southern hemisphere, the same thing happens. It's a little bit less pronounced, but particularly under the canopy in the southern hemisphere, you're going to have higher uptake of CO2. It's, more pro it's just stronger in the northern hemisphere because we have more forests and we have more industrial um, CO2, we have more industrial activity. So you can actually, uh, NASA's done these nice uh, combined models and direct measurements of these dynamics, and you can actually see CO2 concentration increase in the northern hemisphere. <clears throat> Pretty wild. Okay, <clears throat> this is the last thing I want to do. Um, be mindful of your time. Um, you know, kind of one of the things that I'm going for here is, um, you know, Every good conspiracy theory has an element of truth. You can't have a good you cannot have a good conspiracy theory without some plausibility or some truth. And I'm not like especially one of those people that's into conspiracy theories, um, but you know sometimes you have to confront them one way or another. And anytime um, I think uh, climate change included, when you you have to confront misinformation. It's, we have an obligation to look at some of these things. So um, here's, here's something, you know, is the Earth's climate uh, variable through history? And you'll, you'll hear this as a rejoinder to uh, suggestions that we should do something to intervene about climate change, that the Earth's history is, is variable. And yes, that's true. It was once virtually the surface of the earth was virtually frozen solid into a single mass of ice, right? I mean, the, earth, the climate is variable. Um, but the usual pattern, um, uh, but the current changes are more rapid and also are following um, changes in atmospheric chemistry and specifically the concentration of greenhouse gases that are associated with industrial activity. So uh, what you do about it uh, is, an op I think, an open question. Um, you could even argue about when it is appropriate to do something about it or how much money you should spend on that. That's all something that we can have a reasonable con a, a discussion about. But whether or not it is happening, that is something that we can infer from pretty good data. Um, this other thing, I kind of went into this, you know, climate change cannot occur because it violates the second law of thermodynamics. That sounds great. That's like a bunch of techno speak being thrown at you. Um, but it's really a selective of application of facts. Um, climate variability does not violate the second law uh, because energy in equals energy out. Some of that energy gets stored as uh, temporarily as heat in the atmosphere. Um, and then this, uh, this other one, um, maybe you've heard this, that forecast changes in global temperature are much lower than diurnal variation. So that's the difference between temperature at night and day. That is wildly misleading. One degree of temperature increase uh, or five is not much from one day to the other. The problem is that the, when you're talking about average temperature across the globe, the effects of that will be much more severe in particular places. Remember, and one of the points of showing you the, um, the global ocean conveyor system is to make the point that climate is variable when you look across, it's heterogeneous when you look across the surface of the earth. And what you can show, what you can uh, infer strongly is that one degree change in average temperature will have very different effect on, say, hurricane frequency in the, in the Atlantic coast of the U.S., drought frequency in the western U.S. or in Australia, and other kinds of changes that could be deleterious. So we have to go deeper. Oh, here's my last one. The last one I'll give you. Life without greenhouse gases 
uh, without greenhouse gases, life would not exist on Earth. It's a true statement, after all, after all uh, actually. And you can look at Mars. Uh, when Mars lost its oceans, um, it, lost, uh, it lost its oceans when it lost its atmosphere. Without greenhouse gases, it turned into uh, what we, as far as we know, is a lifeless planet. Um, uh, it was not always that way. It's certainly evidence that it once had liquid oceans and could have supported life, but when it lost its atmosphere, it, um, you know, its, its surface changed dramatically. True statement, but um, irrelevant in a lot of respects. Um, changes in atmospheric chemistry have a measurable effect on climate. And you can go to the primary literature and other sources to get good data to back that up. Okay, I'm gonna stop the screen recording.